Welcome to the three minute thesis information and training video. I put this video together uh, to give you some uh, you know, idea of what the three minute thesis uh, competition is all about and to provide you with a little training on how to put your presentation together. My name is Steve Seidel. I was a graduate teaching fellow within the College of Graduate Studies and I was one of the founders of the Graduate Resource and Opportunity Workspace um, area for graduate students course and uh, also brought the three minute thesis uh, competition to Corpus Christi. Um, I've been serving as kind of the MC for that event uh, ever since. So uh, let, let me tell you about uh, this competition a little bit. The three minute thesis competition of course is an academic research communication competition that was developed at the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, TAMU CC held its first 3MT competition during the 2015-2016 years where we started by having separate competitions for doctoral and master's graduate students. Uh, this year we're doing things a little differently, so uh, starting this fall, uh, TAMU CC will hold 3MT competitions uh, in both fall and spring and in which both master's and doctoral students will compete, so you get to compete against each other whether you're master's or doctoral. The winner of the fall competition will be given preference for moving on to the regional competitions. Okay, the three minute thesis, um, as we said, was developed in Australia. And the premise of the competition is to develop academic presentation and research communication skills. It supports the development of students' capacities to effectively explain their research in a language appropriate to an intelligent but non-specialist audience. That's kind of key to the whole thing, right? Uh, so when you go into this, you have to understand that your um, audience and, of course, more importantly, the judges um, are going to be selected in areas that perhaps have no idea what the language of your discipline is all about. So you have to speak in a language that they can understand. Um, graduate students will have three minutes, of course, to present compelling or orations on the dissertation topics or thesis topics. Uh, and their significance. Um, the 3MT is not an exercise in watering down the research, but forces students to consolidate their ideas and concisely explain their research discoveries. Um, and if you've ever had the chance to take a large document, okay, such as a dissertation or thesis, and try to whittle that thing down where you present that whole thing in a three minute idea, kind of like an elevator speech, uh, it is not the easiest thing to do. Okay, especially when you don't have notes, okay? Um, as to be eligible, you have to be a doctoral student or a master's student and um, enrolled in program at TAMU CC um, and actively engaged in research. A doctoral students is most likely going to be your dissertation research um, to be eligible. Um, master's students, most likely their thesis research. If you are involved with the research project um, of your own and it is not one of those, please come talk to us over at GROW and we can talk to you about you know, whether or not you're eligible to present that or not. So if you have any questions, just come by. Uh, but generally, this is dissertation and thesis research if you have it. So um, uh, another thing with that is that in terms of competition, if you actually do this more than once and you have placed first, second, or third, okay, which are the three places, um, third we may call it people's choice as well, um, just note you cannot compete again in the future. However, if you did not place in a previous competition, you're welcome to keep on uh, presenting at these competitions. One of the nice things this year is that uh, we were able to get the prize money up, okay? Uh, one of the reasons that was kind of really important to bring that up was because uh, this, uh, the winnings are, of course, subject to tax. So um, we needed to give prizes that were high enough that, you know, after taxes, it was still a very nice prize. So I think we've done it this year with the winner getting a $1,000. Uh, and, of course, a paid admission and travel to compete at the regional competition, which will be held at the Conference for Southern Graduate Schools. Um, that rotates around through the southern region, so 
Um, I think this year it's actually just right in Texas up in Baylor. Um, second place, it's uh, $750, $750 okay, prize. And third place is a $500 prize. So they're really very nice prizes. And hopefully um, that should bring people out to compete. Okay, here's the general rules, and it's not like we make them up. These are the rules that uh, work no matter where you go for 3MT. These are the same rules. So um, please note what these things say because you can't break these. So a single static PowerPoint slide is permitted. So no slide trans transitions, animations, movement of any kind are allowed. The slide is to be presented from the beginning of the oration. Okay, no additional electronic media. Sound, video are permitted. No additional props. Costumes, musical instruments, laboratory equipment are permitted. Uh, presentations are limited to three minutes maximum and competitors that exceed that three minutes are disqualified. Okay? Uh, there is an official timer. I'm going to provide you with that timer uh, if you choose to participate so you can practice with it. Uh, but yes, if that timer goes off and you're still talking, okay, um, then unfortunately you'll be disqualified from the competition okay uh, you may have a word where you're thanking the judges we'll probably let that one go but in general um, you shouldn't go over that um, three minute mark uh, presentations are to be spoken word so no poems no rap songs okay or anything like that uh, they're to commence from the stage so you pretty much have to stay up there you can't run around the audience uh, presentations are considered to have commenced when the presenter starts their presentation through either movement or speech and the decision of the adjudicating panel is final okay as far as what you're going to be judged on uh, there's uh, two big areas and that's comprehensive content and engagement and communication so with comprehension and content uh, did the presentation provide an understanding of the background to the research question being addressed and its significance? Did the presentation clearly describe the key results of the research, including conclusions and outcomes? Did the presentation follow a clear and logical sequence? Was the thesis topic key results and research significant and outcomes communicated in a language appropriate to a non-specialist audience? Did the speaker avoid scientific jargon, explain terminology, and provide adequate background information to illustrate the points? And did the presenter spend adequate time on each element of their presentation, or did they elaborate for too long on one aspect, or was the presentation rushed, right? Um, without a doubt, when you look at this stuff, the secret to everything is practice makes perfect and to get other people's opinions of your talk prior to actually getting up in front of all that, those people and presenting it. Uh, engagement and communication, okay? So did the oration make the audience want to know more? Okay, so um, think of this as, you know, you're selling this research as well. So you want your audience to be very interested. So yeah, it's all about engaging them and you want them hanging on the edge of their seats. You want them riveted, right? Uh, so was the presenter careful not to trivialize or generalize their research? Did the presenter convey enthusiasm for their research? Uh, did the presenter capture and maintain the audience attention? Did the speaker have sufficient stage presence, okay, eye contact, vocal range, and maintain a steady pace and have a confident stance? And did the PowerPoint slide enhance the presentation? Was it clear, legible, and concise, right? We'll talk a little bit about all these things. Okay. Uh, one thing that's kind of hard to teach uh, in a, just a short little video of course is presence and I'll talk about that as well. Um, but here you might uh, seek guidance of some of the theater folks, perhaps uh, Dr. Don Luna, um, maybe willing to help you out and give you some pointers here on um, the use of theater techniques in presenting your research because uh, it goes a long way especially in this section okay to get an idea of when you put this presentation together right um, 
you know, you'll have a chance to look at a lot of different talks. And there is a 3MT competition site uh, that uh, University of Queensland hosts. And it has a ton of winning talks. And I would encourage you to look at as many of those as possible. I'll give you the uh, location later here. Um, but looking at a bunch of these, and I've seen um, three different of the regional competitions as well uh, to identify and look at the winners of those things. Um, you can divide those talks into really about six different parts. Okay, so I want to introduce you kind of to these sections, and this can make up the structure of your presentation. Um, if you're clever, you can kind of mix these things around and kind of put your own um, you know, your own special touches to them. Um, but yeah, this information is going to be contained in just about any winning talk. So first of all, the hook, right? Uh, you want to get the audience interested. So you want to introduce your topic of study in a way that grabs their attention. Okay. You have the problem, um, and you want to convey the problem to an audience in terms of that they can understand and appreciate its importance. So this is your research problem, okay? Which is not the same thing as that research question, right? Um, so you want to build up to it. What is exactly the problem you're trying to solve? The research question, okay, uh, should be probably on the backside of that problem description where your problem description should lead to an obvious statement of that research question, right? Um, then talk about how you did it, right? Your approach. So describe your approach to answering the research question. And then after that, you're ready to share kind of what did you find? And so the discovery section would be what did you find out? What conclusions did you make? And then finally at the end, right? Um, whenever you make a presentation, it's always nice to go circular. So kind of take a look at your hook um, and try to come back to what you were talking about in the hook if you can. Okay, but the big picture, right? Um, this is probably the most dramatic section of what you're trying to do, but you want to talk about how your research will change the world, right? It's not expected that you change the world in some big manner, but one, what is your little piece that you're contributing, right? Research is all about tiny steps. What is, what is it that you have accomplished with this research? Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, so the hook itself, you want to grab the, the audience right from the start by uh, starting with something that almost everyone is interested in, uh, just to hook them into the presentation, right? Something that they can understand, right? Take a look at 3MT winning presentations on the internet and explore a wide range of hooks others have used effectively. The idea is to build a bridge uh, between uh, everyday experience of your audience and the more academic material uh, you plan to present. Um, I know this is a video, but I'll also supply you with the actual PowerPoint, okay? Um, but there's a link right here to the 3MT winning presentations that you can go to. You can kind of see the site right there, 3 minute thesis uq.edu.au and watch 3MT and you'll find uh, the site that has a bunch of winning presentations there. Okay. After that, we want to talk about the problem, right? So after hooking the audience, you'll be ready to describe that problem you choose to tackle. Note that this is not your research question, but it's the big picture version of it. So it's important to convey why this problem is important. Uh, more specifically, why it should be important to the audience. If there is terminology that needs to be defined for your research question, this is where you do it, okay? Um, but make sure you avoid the use of jargon that your audience will not be able to remember, follow. Uh, just makes it tougher to understand what you're talking about. Okay, uh, now that they know the problem, right, it's, and its importance, right, it's time to tell them where you uh, come into the story. So what question are you trying to answer uh, through the work that you're doing? So be sure that you state this in a way that is understandable to the audience. Any terms that needed to be defined should have already been defined while describing the problem. And this will likely be a very short piece of your presentation, but it's critical because it marks the transition between the problem and the approach. 
A clearly stated research question makes your presentation much easier to follow for the audience. Okay. Then you're ready to talk about methodology or approach. Um, you stated your research question. The audience is begging to hear what you chose to do to answer the question and time permitting why you chose that approach. Uh, don't forget uh, who you're talking to at this point. Keep the description of your approach simple, okay, as simple as possible. If your methods were complicated, you may want to use your visual slide, okay? You got that one slide up there. Uh, it may become useful uh, as a tool to help you explain methodology, okay? It's not that you have to use the slide for that. Hopefully, you can do that with your oration, okay? Um, but if you need it, it's there, okay? Uh, after hearing your approach, the audience should be able to foresee the possible outcomes of your investigation, right? Um, so they should be way ahead of you. They should even kind of guess at what your um, hypotheses are before you might even state them. Okay, now it's time to tell the audience what you found and what your conclusions uh, or the conclusions that you made. So you won't have time to tell them all the details, so stick to the major findings, uh, which should include the most interesting ones. Um, when you consider a result interesting, make sure you explain why it's interesting and be excited about this section, right? Your passion should peak, right, with those discoveries, right? This is the most exciting part of your research. Even if you, um, I should say, even if you didn't find anything, okay? Um, Passion can go both ways. You can talk, <laughs> you could have, be very disappointed and you can kind of illustrate that as well. Um, but big picture, right? We're ready to, you know, we're, we're getting near the end of that three minutes and we got to finish things up. So you want to draw closure on your talk, right? And bring your talk full circle uh, by returning to the big picture problem you started with and end with a grand statement of how your research okay, or research agenda may or will change the world, right? Um, once again, passion is key. All right, so what mistakes, um, at least that I've recognized uh, that people make along the way? So um, students sometimes fail to connect their research to the big picture, okay? So um, their audience really doesn't know why anything is really important and what good is it. Uh, students don't work hard enough to engage the audience curiosity about their work. Okay, this takes some work. So uh, typically, if you're excited about the work, your audience will be excited about the work, right? Um, think of your audience as really mirroring your emotions. I think it's always a good thing. Um, so if you are totally enjoying yourself, right, your audience will be enjoying themselves as well. Okay, uh, through that talk. If, on the other hand, you're struggling uh, to get things there and it's really, you can see the stress that you're going through to present your own work, the audience is going to be stressed out too. And of course, the judges probably will act accordingly to that. Um, sometimes students neglect the visual component of the presentation um, where they don't really make good use of it. Okay, so we need to talk a little bit about good use of that. Um, boy, the slides I've seen are all over the place. From some, people just have a picture, okay? But things should be very relevant. But we'll talk about the presentations, uh, or so the slides, in a little bit. Okay, um, students didn't leave enough room to practice the presentation. So, yeah, you can tell when people wait to last minute to put these things together, because it doesn't look like a conversation. I mean, in the end, um, you should know this thing so well that you get up there and don't think of it as a performance, but think of it a conversation between you and the audience. And if you're there, right, that's where you want to be. Um, be it a passionate conversation. Um, last, uh, students failed to demonstrate their enthusiasm for the project, right? And by all means, right, you need that. Right. Just remember, you want your audience enthusiastic about your work. It's the best way to do it is for you to be enthusiastic about that work as well. Okay, so 
Let's look at a few examples of winning presentations. And for each of these presentations, try to identify the six parts of the presentation. Um, this first one, Karthik, uh, I think it's Sukumar, okay, from Purdue University. I um, want you to watch this one. And um, mainly I chose this one because the six parts were so obvious uh, throughout this talk. Uh, so let's take a peek at this one real quick. Hey, how many times have you seen a Peyton Manning make that inch-perfect pass and thought to yourself, wow, how did he do that? Or listen to Adele or Beyonce hit that perfect note that completely mesmerizes you. I've always wondered what makes certain people excel in their field and set them apart from others. As I was trying to beginning to explore, to identify differences between experts and novices in different fields, aircraft pilot performance seemed the perfect fit. Did you know 80% of air crashes are caused due to pilot error? In 2009, an air crash led the Federal Aviation Administration to change a regulation on pilot recruitment. Instead of 250 hours, Pilots now require 1,500 hours to pilot a commercial U.S. carrier. This change in regulation clearly shows the importance of experience, flying hours, and most importantly, expertise in piloting an aircraft. This brings me to my primary research question. Are there significant differences between expert and novice pilots based on their brain activity? Now, I use an electroencephalographic or an EEG device to measure brain activity in expert and novice pilots. The recorded brain activity helps me understand the specific parts of the brain and the dominant cognitive processes while they are flying. Surprisingly, what I found was the expert pilots show significantly lesser brain activity than novice pilots, which is a direct result of more efficient brain usage. I believe these cognitive processes that are specific to expert pilots are integral to achieving expertise. Keeping focus on the specific parts of the brain, we can now develop better training tools and tests for novice pilots. This change will help in accelerating their progress from a novice to becoming an expert. Moreover, I also believe that this idea is not specific to pilots alone. We can use this research to and extrapolate it to understand expert performance in so many other fields. So next time you see a Manning or a Beyonce perform, think of me. I might just know the secret. Okay, so in that talk, I think you will pretty easily have been able to pick out those six parts that I was talking about. In this next example, um, I chose this one really because of how the speaker um, acts out these very various characters, okay? Um, and just kind of note what she does with her voice. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is go through a presentation that's totally monotone, right? Like you're reading something and just going through it and, right, um, you'll put your audience to sleep really fast doing this. So in this talk, uh, Megan Posey uh, throws a little theater uh, into her talk uh, by acting out some characters. And what that essentially does for her, um, it draws her audience in. And it's really easy to listen to because her vocal inflection changes wildly um, when it goes into these characters, uh, which makes the talk just much more easier to listen. But let's take a look at this one. Parents and teachers have become increasingly concerned about girls following the 2006 advent of Facebook. It's been blamed for a rise in bullying and a decline in social skills. My research, however, takes a slightly different approach and looks at three things. Grade 8 girls, identity, and Facebook's most commonly used feature, status updates. It's based on a simple and age-old premise. If all the world's a stage, then surely Facebook is just another stage on which actors can perform. And what do all actors want? Desirable reactions from their audiences. This involves trying a number of different strategies on for size. 
Should I present myself as kind, needy, self-sacrificial, talented, intimidating? So, dramaturgical metaphor in hand, I set about answering two questions. First, which of these strategies are Grade 8 girls using in their status updates? And second, how and why are Grade 8 girls using their status updates more broadly? I used a mixed methods approach and 349 surveys, 9 interviews and 445 status updates later, I had some answers. I collected updates ranging from long weekend, yay, to piss off, to how do people just have sex with complete strangers? I can't even order pizza over the phone. And I coded these status updates according to the strategies these girls were using to present themselves. While you would expect that bullying and attention seeking would rate highly, they didn't. Girls most commonly presented themselves as likeable by using flattery and compliments. And this is exactly what happens in offline settings. You see, girls need to maintain synergy between their online and offline identities. Why? Because everything you say on Facebook can be used against you in the court of social approval. When I asked the girls why they updated their own statuses, they said, oh, just to let other people know what I'm doing if I'm bored. But when I asked them why other people updated their statuses, they said, she'll just do anything to get attention. She just wants the boys to like her. This might explain why more than 30% of the girls in my study reported updating their statuses at least once per day. Because status updates will be interpreted differently by every audience member, identities are in a constant state of flux. Identity becomes less a question of who am I and more a question of what do you see in me, what do you want in me. My research challenges the fearful notion of an authentic offline identity and an inauthentic online identity. It shows that, like the classroom, Facebook is just another space for girls to experiment with their identities, engage the reactions of others. So, if there's one message we should be sending to Grade 8 girls on Facebook, know your audience. Thank you. Okay, so I also want to talk about kind of a secret ingredient uh, to all these presentations. And what I've labeled this is really just presence, right? Uh, you can put together the most rehearsed presentation, right? Excellent um, material, right? You've organized it perfectly, um, but still lack kind of this presence uh, that's there, all right? So what exactly is this thing? So you want to speak, right, with an awareness of how your audience is responding, right? Uh, so be aware of what they're doing, right? You want to get them excited. So if you notice that they aren't, we need to step it up to um, get them excited. Uh, use your body language that's consistent with your presentation goals, right? So you should move with authority and purpose throughout the talk. Uh, you want to maximize the vocal expressiveness. Once again, that's why I wanted to see Megan Posey. She definitely put that in there. Um, speak slowly and deeply. Uh, if you've never, and I'm sure all of you have done performances one time, and then you go back and look at those recordings, what you'll find is that um, when you get up on stage, you speak so much faster than you did when you rehearsed it. Okay, so um, you want to, chill out okay and take a deep breath and go through this in the same pace that you did right when you uh, practice so uh, develop the content of your speech so that it will lead your audience to respond the way you would like them to of course it's easy to say but kind of not always easy to do and you need to become comfortable with being in that spotlight right it's really easy to say these things but to actually uh, be able to do them as two different things. Okay. So in general, right, a person has pe presence will be passionate. They'll be comfortable. They be, they'll portray confidence, enthusiasm. They'll be authentic and captivating, right? And if you put all those ingredients together, right, that's right where you want to be, right? Uh, once again, easy to say, not so easy to do, okay? Um, I think one of the easiest thing to say about this is that, um, you know, don't think of it as a presentation. If you get to the point where you think of this as really having that very 
caring, empathetic conversation, and of course, enthusiastic conversation that you're having with the audience, you just might be there. Okay. But I want to give you an example of this as well. Okay. And probably my favorite um, talk of all time is uh, this one, which is by Rosanna Stevens. And it really wasn't because of the six ingredients. Um, she had a very clever use of her slide, which happened, happened to be a totally blank slide, and you'll see. Um, but um, when looking at this, what I want you to pay attention to is just how she talks with the audience and how comfortable uh, she is um, sitting there, right, in the spotlight. Right? She's very aware of her audience and she leads them where she wants them to go. So let's take a look at that one. It might seem as though I've started speaking with a blank PowerPoint slide behind me, but there are actually a bunch of things on this slide. You just can't see them yet. To your right is a Ferrari. I drew myself in white. To your left is a soy latte in a white takeaway cup. And in the middle is a home, in, I drew myself in white, a home among the gum trees. Lots of plum trees, clothesline out back, veranda out front, and an old rocking chair. It's interesting how you can't see things when the context they're surrounded by makes them seem invisible. Suddenly this slide full of nothing is full of white stuff. You just needed help to see it. Here's something else you can't see. This slide is actually a black slide with a white rectangle pasted over the top of it. Over 200 years ago, white people arrived and settled over the top of already established Aboriginal life. And colonization happens today. The settled way we are encouraged to live, the ways we are encouraged to learn and consume, how often we are encouraged to wash and the ways we think about and use nature are actually pretty white. People who fit into this society are taught to think of it as normal and awesome, but if you don't fit in, whiteness is very visible because it can be depressingly inescapable. Aboriginal and black academics and activists are suggesting that one of the first steps toward creating a more equal and considerate society is for white people today to identify and understand the dominance of our culture. From there, we can challenge how, in modern Australia, one way of life smothers another. But it's difficult to challenge something if you've been taught not to see it. Is a job white? Is a house white? Is organic gluten-free food white? If I fall into the vortex of cat videos on YouTube and I'm wearing my pajamas, am I just procrastinating? Or am I white procrastinating? <laughs> My research is about understanding what whiteness looks like and how it works. I'm collecting and analyzing Aboriginal accounts of feeling unwelcome, ignored, and misunderstood in society. And from that material, I'm piecing together a picture of white Australia that we can begin to debate. My thesis is a novel. The plot is a secret, but this conversation needs to be communicated well beyond the walls of a university. My hope is that research in this field will point toward a more equal, considerate, and respectful Australia that is so much more than just white. Okay, the one thing from Rosanna Stevens' talk that I think you would notice is, boy, she really uses those hand gestures well. And it's really important, of course, to, if you're going to use hand gestures, to make them purposeful. And once again, those nonverbals need to be consistent with the talk. And I think she does a great job of this. Um, regarding a few tips, um, she also was nice enough uh, to record some of these. So I definitely want you to kind of listen to her talk about a few tips that she has as a um, someone that's gone through this and been a winner uh, with 3MT. So uh, let's listen to some of her tips. 
Hi, my name is Rosanna Stevens. I'm the winner of the ANU Three Minute Thesis Competition and runner up and People's Choice in the Trans Tasman Three Minute Thesis Competition for 2014. And I'm a student here at ANU in the School of Archaeology and Anthropology. And I'm within the interdisciplinary and cross cultural research program here at ANU. I'm here to give you my three top tips for getting the most out of your three minute thesis experience. So, my first tip think about your slide. When I spoke, I had a blank slide, and it wasn't for no reason. When you get up there and you're speaking, you want to make sure that that three minutes that you have are as exciting and informative as possible. And one of the best ways that you can do that is by making sure that you really think about what's on the slide behind you. Don't just have a pretty picture because. Make sure that what you have behind you is helping explain what you're doing in a way that maybe your words can't. Uh, so, for example, with my blank slide, I really wanted to communicate that the audience couldn't necessarily see something that I wanted them to. And through that concept, I was able to communicate a lot more about my research. Great things to include on a slide might be diagrams, um, you know, funny pictures that do relate to what you're doing. An illustration of what you're talking about can really, really help the audience go that extra step in understanding what you're talking about in a really useful way that helps convince them that what you're doing is really interesting. Tip two, change or save the world. That might sound like a really big thing to do, but the three minute thesis is a really great time to check in with yourself about why you're doing your research and how it's important to you, but also how it might be important to the broader community. Remember that you're doing the three minute thesis because you're communicating your research to a lay audience. And a lay audience wanna understand why you're passionate about what you're talking about. So sit down and think about how your research isn't necessarily changing everybody's lives, but is changing the world in a way. So, for example, with my research, I'm writing a novel, sure, that's my thesis, but on top of that, I'm actually wanting to interrogate the way that society functions to create a better sense of equality culturally and racially in Australia. And when you talk about your research in those terms, the audience can suddenly relate to what you're talking about in a new way that helps them shed light on why what you're doing is so weighted and vital and why you're passionate about it in the first place. Tip three, in the words of a famous Disney princess, let it go. Letting it go might sound like a really difficult thing to do, but when you get up on that stage and you've done all of that preparation leading up to you speaking, you wanna be able to get up there and make sure that there isn't an extra dialogue going on in your head and it's really hard to stop that voice. People do the three minute thesis for all kinds of reasons. They do it because they're competitive. They do it because they like speaking. They do it because they want to challenge themselves to become better at communicating their research. Or in the case of me, I really wanted to make sure that my research was answerable to a broader audience and that they felt like they could talk about it to me. So when you get up there, no matter which reason you're engaging with to get up on that stage, you need to make sure that in that moment, you rely on all of the practice that you've done and you just let it go. Enjoy the experience and that's really hard to do but a great way of practicing that is to use a space, imagine that you are getting up in front of an audience, imagine that there are lights on you, close your eyes for a minute and then pretend that you really are starting it for the first time and there is no going back. You'll find that you will actually make a lot of mistakes that you didn't think that you were going to make in the first place but also this, su this surprising experience is going to mean that when it comes to getting up on that stage, you really can just let it go. So much more than just white. Okay, so um, she has some great suggestions overall. One thing I do, do wanna point out is when it comes down to practice, right? Find that place that you want to practice and, you know, don't go through this in your head and quiet, um, but be as right similar to that actual place that you're going to present as possible. I mean, if you want to go into school and you go kind of after hours, you could probably find a classroom, walk in, and even though there's no one there, you could give your presentation in front of some empty seats. Um, it's actually a much better way to practice than just sitting at home. Okay. So... Uh, try to be in the same similar environment to what you'll be in is the way to work it. But 
uh, do it out loud, right? You don't want to do things just kind of thinking them of what you're going to say. You need to perform, okay? Because you can't, if you can't say it, you can't do it. And the more practice you have, of course, the better. Um, but definitely go in there with plenty of it. Um, so good presentations in the end, right? They engage the audience. Um, and I said, remember, they vote for the People's Choice Award here, um, which um, we'll, we'll see on that. Uh, typically, we may have a third place or it's People's Choice. I want to bring back People's Choice. We didn't use it uh, in a past competition. So um, audience tends to like to do that. Um, explicitly connect the research to the real world right? Uh, speak in terms, of course, that they can understand. Speak clearly and comprehensively. Remember, the audience does not speak your discipline's language, so no academic language. Of course, choose your words wisely. Use active verbs, shorter words, sentences, and avoid jargon and acronyms. Uh, pace yourself and find your own rhythm. Like I said, when you get up in front of people to perform, you tend to go a little fast. Okay, so take a concerted effort to slow down a little bit consciously right slow your talking speed practice your material and delivery often i already mentioned this the more familiar you are with your script and topic it'll help your presentation flow more naturally and easier okay so if you run into problems you won't get stuck uh, and you hopefully will be able to ad lib right through any kind of problems that you might uh, experience So if you need to look at more 3MT videos, just remember, uh, you can check out um, the world of 3MT videos from all over the place uh, at 3 minutethesisorg the 3MT Showcase. Uh, of course, many universities in the U.S. also have their own competition, so you can find the winners um, from their videos many times online by seeking YouTube or just Googling something like 3MT Winner Videos, and that will help. Okay, so... Take a look. Uh, I think the more videos you check out before actually putting together yours, the better. And kind of note the things that you like about them or the things you don't like about them um, and adjust your presentation accordingly. Okay. But without a doubt, do not procrastinate. Start preparing today. I know some people that want to compete have already started this and they started actually, I think, <laughs> probably in the spring uh, putting things together. Um, to maybe present. So um, it's nothing that you can't accomplish, say, in a month, but it is going to take time for you to put together that script and start practicing today. Okay, so if you do need any assistance, um, I'm always happy to help students. You can always contact me. Um, Easiest thing to do is probably just go right to Grow and talk to them. They can put you in touch with me if you need to reach me. Or uh, you can email me. Um, here's my email address and phone number on campus. Uh, easy to find. I'm here quite a bit. Um, also, if you kind of go, well, it'd be nice if someone, if I could get someone to videotape me, uh, that's probably possible as well. Just talk to people in Grow and they'll be glad to kind of help you out um, with whatever they can. Okay, so do that. We also, of course, have a 3MT website. Uh, so you can, uh, well, you know the, the national one, but there's also a TAMU CC 3MT website as well. Okay, you can check out. Uh, if you have questions about um, registering, um, I put a link here for the registration um, on this video. It'll be on the PowerPoint. Uh, that's the company, so you can access it. Um, or you can stop by the Grow Suite. You can call the Grow Suite at, at 2507 and talk to people about registration. But, of course, October 5th, I believe, is the deadline uh, for the Fall 18. Uh, but please check uh, with Grow for all the details of the competition. Okay? Uh, the competition itself usually is at the beginning um, in early November.